What's up, family? Thank you for tuning in to the Dream Nation podcast. My name is Casanova. I'll be your host, and I'm excited to be bringing to you entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and trailblazers from around the world. Stay locked in with us because we're about to go on a journey that will change your life. What's up, Dream Nation? We are back again with an episode that I'm sure will deliver so much value to each and every person that's thinking about starting a business. But even if you're not thinking about starting a business, you just want to know what does it look like if I want to be a part of a world-class organization? I think that today's guest is going to help us uncover a lot of the secrets when it comes to building empire. So without further ado, go ahead and help me welcome Welcome, Mr. Jason Swink, to the show. Jason, you want to say what's up to Dream Nation? Hey, what's up, Dream Nation? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man, it's a pleasure. So for you, we found you because you have been a leading uh, catalyst when it comes to people starting digital agencies. And I think a lot of people right now, they're learning social media, they're learning marketing, and they want to know exactly how they could start their own agency. They want to know what's the steps look like and and what are the pitfalls and obstacles I should uh, look after. So I want to first, before we get into all of that and dropping so much value, I want to always like to give the proper introduction. And so before you became, because you have a podcast as well, and you've been running your podcast for what, six years now? Six years. Six, six years. years. Wow. Uh, that Amazing. So you've been a staple in this game. Obviously, podcasting is really starting to take off now. We still have not hit a peak and we don't know, that might not be for many a years, but you've been a staple. But before all of that, before you became a person who helps thousands of entrepreneurs start their own agency and do it the right way, let's take it back to when you were just a young boy and tell me, who is Jason Swank? Uh, you know, I've always been a hustler. You know, I've always loved creating and, and seeing about how can I be more resourceful? So, I mean, you know, I... I was watching an episode many years ago with my wife and we were watching Dirty Jobs. And I was like, I had like every one of those, like mm -hmm. literally like I used to go in the swamps to get golfers golf balls and sell it back to them. You know, like I used to clean the bottom of boats. I like it was all kinds of like all different types when I was younger. Was that because your, your family was into like all those or like, why did you, how did you come about all of these jobs? I, I just liked working. I liked making money. <laughs> you know, I hey, like money. I hear you and, there. Uh, I didn't expect anybody to give it to us. So, was entrepreneurship big in your family when you were growing up? Like, what type of a childhood did you have? Yeah, no my my dad was you know uh, hardworking middle class. Uh, you know, was a banker. You know, for a company called Sally May and a couple other banks. And uh, so he was an entrepreneur. My grandfather was a carpenter, and uh, you know, my mother was a school teacher. So. You know, I was kind of, you know, other than my grandfather being like a carpenter for his own business. Yeah. I was kind of the first. Got it. So what made you decide to make that jump? What what didn't you like about going the, the steady route? Well, I, I, I think it was, I kind of fell into it, right? Like I always tell people they're on the agency side, they're accidental agency owners, right? So out of, I went to Florida State University and uh, the one thing I learned there was how to outsource and I was a computer programmer, but I outsourced everything. So when I got a job at Arthur Anderson, you can only imagine how bad of a programmer I was hmm. and, and, and I didn't like it. And, you know, I graduated, you know, let's see. The you didn't like programmer or you didn't like feeling like that you weren't the top of your class. Both, both. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm unemployable too. So what I didn't tell you early on, like, especially when I had my summer jobs, like one summer I was fired from three jobs. <laughs> so I, like literally, but I realized why. And it's because I was always made to do my own thing, right? I never wanted to quit. So I made people fire me. Mm. And so I worked for Arthur Anderson for six months and I hated it. And at the time, one of my friends looked like Justin Timberlake, like to the T, like yeah. literally. And I was like, man, I got, I'm going to do a website and we're going to create a website called In Shit, making fun of In Sync. And it's going to yeah. have the four of us. And the website got really popular. And then I had a couple of people go, hey, can you design me a website? So this is in 99, right? Not many people have websites. This is really new. I was like, sure. 
And so that's why I said I'm an accidental agency owner. Like you were saying in, in the, the show in the very beginning of like a lot of people know how to do a service. Right. Especially around marketing. And then people are going to be like, hey, can you do that for me? You did such a good job on yourself. And then before you know it, you're starting to start your digital agency. Right. Wow. And so Florida State, then you start working this job and, and you create this website. Was this website your first ever attempt at, at service and, and now building your own business? Exactly. Yeah. It was for a, a real estate agent because he, he literally, um, I remember uh, Charlie Commander. Thank you, Charlie, my first client ever. And then I remember my second was a lawyer and then a marina uh, and then a hair salon. And it just, started building. And then I was like, man, this is awesome. Like, were you still outsourcing at this time? Or were you now getting your hands doing it? So I think where a lot of people struggle at in any service based business, where there's coaching consultancy, it doesn't matter. I think they struggle with first off, how do I know where to price? Right? Because that's a scary thing. You feel like you have a good service, someone else says, Hey, will you do it for me? But prices are all over the board, because you get to essentially name your price and you don't want to lose out on your first client. How was that for you? How did you know where to price yourself? I didn't. I mean, it was all like, it's like a Vegas buffet. It's like you try out everything, see what works and what you like. You know, my first, and and that's something I always ask on my podcast, like, well, a lot of times I do. I'm like, what'd you charge? And it seems like almost everybody charged like $500. I don't know why. Maybe it's because it's under four digits and it's big enough, I guess, for us. We'd be like, cool, yeah. It takes me a couple hours. I'll make 500 bucks. Heck yeah. Right. Let's, I can party on that for a long time. <laughs> for sure. So you started out, did you start out charging $500 like per website? I did. I did. Then I just kept saying like, as I started getting busier, I started looking at like supply and demand. I was like, Got well, it. Let me see if I can do a thousand. Let me see if I can do 2000. Right. And then I was there for a while. And then I was like, then I started realizing I'm like, it's all about people's expectation because I was still too young to figure out what's the value I deliver. Right. Because I truly believe you should charge on the value. But a lot of us, when we're starting out, we don't know what kind of value we're going to deliver. We just need to be like, what's their expectation? And I remember um, and we started adding on to the team and eventually we grew to a really big agency. But in the very beginning, I remember we were around maybe 700,000 at this time. And I remember getting a call. 700,000 in gross revenue. Uh-huh. Yeah. Got it. And I remember getting this call from this organization I've never heard of. And I remember just rocking this call. I was like, there's no way they're not going to go go with me. And I remember them inviting me to their office. And I remember going into this office and I think it's the biggest boardroom I've ever been in. I was like, this is crazy. And I was the first one in like this, the, the office manager escorted me in and then like all these suits come in. I'm like, oh, sh- crap. Right. <laughs> right. I'm like, cause I started my agency at 22. So I think I was 24 at the time. Mm. Um, so I don't know anything still. And I remember telling them $10,000 for a website. And that was going to be really big for us. And I remember them laughing. And I remember going back to the office and some of the employees were like, what, what happened? I was like, we kind of laughed. I'm like, who'd you meet with? And I remember going, I was like, Brooks, Brooks, Brookshire. They were like, Brookshire Hathaway. I'm like, yeah, how'd you know? They're like, that's like one of the biggest companies. And I lost that deal because they were expecting around 300,000. So I I realized then I had to figure out the expectation of the prospect because you could lose a deal because you're too low because they're going to be like, what, are you selling a stolen car? Like if I I said, I'm going to sell you this Ferrari for a hundred dollars, you're going to be like, is it a matchbox car? Is it a real car? Is it stolen? Like, right. Absolutely. I get it. Wow. So that was a huge, huge lesson, right? It's it's very important to get the expectation up front to understand who you're actually dealing with here. And, and to know, you know, what would you say the biggest lesson that you learned out of there? Was it that you didn't do your homework beforehand to know the type of company that you were dealing with? There, there was a couple. There, I mean, there was definitely a couple lessons. One is I didn't research ahead of time. So I went in there blind. Mm. But also, too, I learned that you there's all different types of expectations in pricing, right? The work I can do 
for a thousand dollars is usually the same work I could do for three hundred thousand. It's just you you mark it up, right? Um, right, it, and it was crazy. I, and I remember another instance. I remember at the time, I think maybe we were around the two million mark at this time, and we were charging twenty thousand dollars for websites. Big jump, five hundred. Right, big, huge. I remember getting this one prospect come in and it was a total jerk, right? Like you'd be like, there's no way I want to work with this person. And at the time I wouldn't say no to people, but I would want them to say no. And so I said, 80,000. And he said, yes. <laughs> I was like, crap. Right. And then, then from there, I realized that there was an opportunity cost of 60,000. So if I could charge... 80,000, but I kept charging 20,000 over here, I was losing $60,000 on every engagement. So then I was like, well, how can I find these people? Hey, what's up, Dream Builder? Have you been getting any value out of this episode? Would you like to get more exclusive content just like this delivered right to your inbox? If so, head on over to dreamnationpodcast.com and you can sign up for the email list and that will give you access to exclusive content and more interviews just like this that's going to be delivered only to our tribe. So head on over to dreamnationpodcast.com. Let's get back to it. Those are big numbers that you're throwing out. And for a lot of people, they're first hearing this and they're saying, oh my God, I'm just trying to get my first client, right? So let's talk about like when you first ever started out, how were you finding these clients? How were you marketing yourself? Like, did you just have the best website in the world or were you proactively like reaching out to people? Yes, I was going through the yellow pages. I was literally, and yet for the people that are just getting started, these are not the ones you sit on a seat so you can see over the steering wheel. <laughs> like, like there is actually numbers and people in there. Right. And so I would, I would call people up. But you know, if I had to do it over again, here, here's here's what I would do, right? So I, I truly believe there needs to be, I'm like dating myself, like people are li listening to me like, who's this gray haired effer, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> talking to us. But I would, I would do kind of three channels, right? I would create an outbound channel. You have to figure out strategies to, you know, reach out to people and see how you can actually help them out. And so in order to do that, though, before you actually even get to a prospecting stage, and here's when I interview agency owners, it probably takes most agency owners five, sometimes 10 years to figure this out. You have to get clarity. You have to figure out what do I have a lot of knowledge in? Who would I just have extreme passion in working for, right? And then, and then go find out who can actually afford what you actually want to charge. So you have to get that clarity. Because if you're just going through the yellow pages like me, I was just starting at A. There was no target. Hmm. And, and like I told you, I had real estate, marinas, all that. That sounds fun, but you're redoing everything all the time. You have right. to be a master of one. Right. And then you can start developing yourself as the choice rather than a choice. So you have to get that clarity. And a lot of people skip that. And it's so important. And so once you know who you're going after and what you want to become, right, now you can steer the ship a little bit better. And then I can say, all right, let me make my top 100 list of people I want to work with. So with me, if I was doing it over again, I love the outdoors. Obviously, I live in Colorado. I also used to race cars. So I know a lot about cars, all that kind of stuff. So I'd be like, all right, let me make a list of all these uh extreme sports. And then I'm going to go after these people. And I'm going to go after them because I know what their biggest challenges are, right? And then I'm going to call up. And I'm going to, you know, mention something like, you know, hey, I know you might be struggling with how, how can you reach your target audience right now? with the pandemic going on and how can you get people to buy? But right now everybody's at home and they're researching how they can make their Jeeps more redneck or bigger tires or their cars faster or whatever it is. Right. And I can show you how you can reach these people faster because you used to just go to trade shows and SEMA and all this in order to get your brand out. Is that something you would want to help with? Guaranteed. I'm going to get their attention. Right. Right. So that's the first one. The second one is develop strategic partnerships. Now that you have that clarity of who you're going after and how you can help them, who else is going after them? That could be strategic partners, 
right? Is there particular technologies that they're using for selling online that I could partner with that, that we can two plus two equals eight? And then the third is an inbound channel. This takes a little bit longer, but you have to create like what we're doing here. We create rich media content, create a podcast. Don't just do a stupid blog. You should have one related to your podcast or create videos. And so as you create this channel, now you have this stool that you can stand on, right? Most people have a stool with one peg and you can only balance for so long until you fall down. But that's what I tell people and that's what I would do. And then you can grow a lot faster. I love it. Now, elaborate more on the on the stool. Because you talked about that. Like, what, what do you mean by the stool? For a lot of people that are listening and they say, okay, I, I don't get that part. Yeah, so most people build their business on one channel. Hmm. And most is referrals. Okay? So if your business is based on referrals, it just ain't scalable. And you're depending on someone else. Hmm. Right? And, and you're looking, and it's not really a strategic partner. It's just like, hey, this person did great on my Facebook ads or did great on YouTube videos for me, and they just send you business. Well, that's relying. And, and what's, what's going to happen is you're going to keep getting the same type of business or lower mm. because they're never going to send you bigger ones, right? Right. And so then you're going to be like wondering, well, I got all this work, and I, and I, I started hiring more people. And then I'm making less money or I'm actually losing money. That's what happens to a lot of people. And then right. you, you make a decision. You're like, well, man, I just wish I could go back to the fun stage where it was just you because you were making okay money, but you had to do everything. And it's the reason being is because you, you're standing on a one-legged stool. You literally, that can break any time. But if you create all these other channels, one channel can go down and you can still stand. Got it. I love it. You can use other things. It's like a backup. Yeah. And what I want everybody to be able to do is build a predictable pipeline mm. where business is constantly keeps coming to you. Because at the end of the day, once you're once you get going in the business and you start figuring a lot of stuff out, and it's learning every day. I still learn stuff every day, right? And I ran the agency for 12 years before selling it. And then I've been doing this for six years and after I sold the agency, I did stupid shit for two years, right? <laughs> that I didn't like. <laughs> and so you're always constantly learning, but you want to get to a point where you can pick and choose the clients you want to work with. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate freedom. It's not to grow your business faster than everybody else. Who cares about that? You want to get to a point where you can pick and choose the stuff you love doing in your business. Right. And you have to have a predictable pipeline in order to get there. So talk to me about what was your biggest, you talked about one where it takes certain agency owners or a lot of agency owners, five to 10 years to recognize, but what was your biggest obstacle you would say in your first 10 years of doing this? Like, is there anything that you look back and you say, this was the challenge that really held me back, whether it was mindset, whether it was resources, what was it for you? It, it was the clarity. Uh, and so I remember so I remember very vividly, it was maybe, we were, we were in the multi-millions at the time. We had a lot of employees and I remember coming home all the time depressed. I remember my wife going like, why are you depressed? I'm like, man, you know, I just, I just don't like what I'm doing anymore. I just, I'm stressed out and my marriage was taking a hit from it. And finally she said, just quit, go take a job, shut it all down. Mm. And I'm like, huh. So that's an option. And literally, I was so like, I was like, I was ready. Right. And I remember, was it again, you not setting the right expectations? Or like, why do you feel like it was taking such a toll on not only you, but your family as well? Well, I mean, like, I was doing it, I felt like I was doing everything. I didn't, I was the I was the toll booth owner. So everything had to flow through me. Hmm. Right. And so I remember, I, interviewing with a company called NASCAR for in marketing. And I remember them asking me a question like, what do you want to do every day? What don't you never want to do again? And I remember thinking about that when I went home. I was like, all right. So I got a sheet of paper out. I drew a circle on an eight and a half by 11 paper. Picture like about as big as my fist. Everything on the outside of the circle, I started writing all the shit I don't like anymore. Like I'd never want to do. And then I spent some time on that. And then once I did that, I said, well, what's all the stuff I really love doing? 
And I wrote that inside the circle. That gave me complete clarity. And then I said, I can do this in the agency. I just need to delegate the stuff I don't want to do anymore. I need to give the power of where we're actually going to my employees because I had no vision for the company. We accidentally got there. So everybody always asked me because they didn't know where we're going. So picture us on a boat, right? We're, we're leaving New York Harbor because it's all the, the, the crazy stuff going on, right? And we're going to London. But I don't tell my team we're going to London. I just tell my team, whenever the boat changes course, come get me every five minutes, waking me up, cha changing course correction. If you've ever driven a boat, changes all the time. If I just told them we're going to London, they can make the right decision. And, and I realized that. And once I gave them the vision of where I wanted to go, then they can make better decisions. And then they could take us, right? Because we're most of us that start companies, we're visionaries. We come up with a thousand ideas, but we suck at execution. So if I can find an operator that can go execute on my vision, because a lot of times I talk to an agency owner or an entrepreneur and they go, I want to go here, but they don't do anything because they don't know how to get there. Well, I'm like, that's, that's fine. You don't need to know how. Hire someone that knows how. And that's what we actually started doing. That's what changed everything for us. And when we did that, then that's when we started growing to a bigger agency. I know that I've even been in this position before. What about when you are an executor, but you don't know how to articulate your vision? So you're on the opposite side of that. You know how to do everything. You know how to put in the work. You're not afraid of the work, but yet, and, and, and you get results off of it, but yet you don't know how to articulate. So when the team asks you like, well, where are we going? You're like, just do this next step. Like, I, I, I'm not really sure on that part. Like, how do you, how do you ever advise people on that? It's about like, I love what Gary Vanderchuk always says about self-awareness. You have to figure out what your strengths are and your weaknesses are. Mm. And you hire for your weaknesses. You don't work on your weaknesses. You double down on your strengths. Exactly. Right. And so find a visionary that can figure out the vision and you go execute. Because if you don't, you're going to be always a freelancer, which is perfectly fine. You'll never have a scalable business. Everything will depend on you because you just keep saying, well, let me do that because I can do it in two seconds. Right. But then it, it, you, you handicap the rest of your team and there's no right or wrong answer, right? Like literally it's just whatever you want. One of the other things that you teach a lot of people is the framework of starting an agency, right? And, and you talked about this. I want to say in one of your later podcasts that you've just talked about that. Talk to me about it. Like why... Should someone, one, start an agency? Is this a good time right now? And if you're thinking about, yeah, I do want to start an agency, um, what does that framework look like? In the history of the world to start a digital agency. I'm not just saying that because I help agency owners. You it said really the best time in the history of the world. Ever, 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 ever. Wow, that's and a I'll powerful statement. I, I'll tell you why. Because everything's shut down. People can't travel. People can't, you know, there's entire businesses that used to depend on going to conferences mm -hmm. or meeting with their prospects in order to sell them that they can't do that anymore. If you understand digital marketing and you can connect those people virtually, you're behind the doctors and the nurses. Those are the most important people, right? During this pandemic. But you're right, you're the first line for the economy because you can connect business owners, right? You can connect the restaurants with people right? And keep the restaurants relevant for posting their recipes and making the, you know, them popular. And so when we get back to some sort of normal that you can go, the best time to start agencies is in a down market. When I started in 99, this was in the dot bomb era, right? When all the dot coms were getting stupid valuations and it crashed. 9-11 was another really good one where we took a giant leap 08, I've seen when I've interviewed tons of people and even helped people sell their agency, a lot of times they've started in 08 because the bigger companies are struggling because they, they're so fat and they're, they have such a huge overhead and they're laying people off. And then people are like, I don't want to work for someone. I can go do this myself. So this is the best time ever to do it. 
Now, when we talk about a digital agency, I know that sometimes it can, obviously we're in the world of online marketing um, and marketing in general. But for a lot of people that may be listening to this and they're still working a nine to five, but they would like to get out and, and they, they do like marketing. What exactly is a digital agency? Is that like running somebody's social media? Does that mean you only do their like social or, or their a display ads campaign? Is that just Facebook? What's a digital agency actually mean? Any digital marketing service that you provide some for someone else. So it could be creating websites, could be Facebook ads, YouTube ads, Instagram ads, uh, managing the social media, writing copy, doing videos, right? It's really any kind of digital marketing doing and, and strategy behind it for a particular prospect or a client. Uh, that's what an agency is. And even if you're a one person, you still can be an agency, even though technically you're a freelancer, but you can still have the amount of resources around you to help you fulfill and to, right? Like there's more right. and more. I have so many agencies now that they work from home. Their whole team is virtual. They might have one operator because they're not the operator that they pay full time, but they're a multi-million dollar agency. Like it's crazy. Like when I look at what you can do now for what, when we were running the agency, it's crazy. Like we had over a hundred people at our agency and eight figure agency. Like, you had to have that many people. Now right. you can have an eight figure agency or bigger and not even close to that number of people. It's, it's just it's the world of outsourcing and now being connected with so many more people. And there's so many more sites out there that give you the resources that whatever you want, if you can connect the dots, like you said, and help somebody else tell their story better, then that's the huge opportunity. So I love that you said it. Now, the question that comes after that to me, and I know a lot of people may be thinking is, do you have to be niched down in that then? Because you just named off seven different services, right? You said the website, you said social media, all these ads. Do I have to be niched down into that? Or can I just go out and try to find any business? When you're, when you're starting out, it's like a Vegas buffet. I'll use that analogy again, yeah. right? You don't know shit right? And so like when I go to a Vegas buffet, or whenever it opens up again, like think about like, or one of those big buffets, like I, I'm a big guy, I love eating, right? Yeah. And I want to try everything, a little bit of everything and go like in the first round. And I'm the, I'm the type that goes back like four times, <laughs> right? And you have to roll my, my fat butt out. But like the second time I'll be like, Ooh, I don't like that. I really like that. And that's what you need to do starting out because mm. some people can start off going, I have passion for this and I know how to do this really well. I'm going to go there and they're going to grow faster. I'll just be honest with you, right? You have to get to a point where you can pick a niche and a specialization where you dominate and then you can add on. Think about when Mark Zuckerberger with Facebook started Facebook. He didn't, he didn't compete with MySpace. Um, like if he tried to compete with MySpace, he would have been crushed right? He started off for Harvard students, Ivy League students, universities, high schools, right? And started building on. That's what you need to do. Because if you try to go after everyone at once, you're going to struggle. But in the very beginning, it's okay to try to do that. But then you have to have like, really be looking for the signs of going, Ooh, I really like that. Let's go after right. this. And, and go all in and you'll grow faster. So you have to have a, a niche. And really that goes back to that clarity, right? Because right. you remember like I was stopping you and you were like, well, what's the strategy to get more business? Here's the framework. You have to get the clarity of where you're going and what you believe in, your core values, all that kind of good stuff. Then you have to position in the right way so you can separate yourself from everybody else. Mm. Then you have to figure out what you're charging, like what's your offering, that you can separate. Then you can go after and coming up with the prospecting systems to go after, right? So there's three foundational systems you have to get before. Right. And then after prospecting, you can do sales. You have to develop a sales system in order to like get the budget every time. You know, what's the proposal process? How do I close and follow up strategies? Then you have to deliver on the work you actually sold right. operations and then leadership. Like, how do you become that CEO, that leader of the organization to make sure we scale and grow? So that's the eight, eight systems you really need to aspire to in that order. 
I love it. I love it, man. That That's so dope. And I love that you broke that down. Clarity is something that a lot of people struggle with, of course. And I know I struggled with that for a very long time as well, because you feel like you can help so many people, right? But then it comes down to when you're helping everybody, almost you're helping nobody because you're stretching yourself so thin, which is where the value of having a team, even if it's an outsourced team comes in at, uh, because it allows you to really be able to focus on what you're good at. And just like you said, double down on your strengths. So love that part. Has there been a huge mentor or a book or something like that that's really allowed you to stay on your path? Because you talked about, you know, there's a couple of times where you felt like quitting. What's been that go-to thing for you or person that has allowed you to know that like, hey, I'm right where I'm supposed to be? In the past, it's been Tony Robbins. Hmm. I don't know him. <laughs> so I have friends that are friends with him, but uh, I don't know him personally. But I remember in college, when I was playing in college I, in tennis, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I remember uh, listening to the tapes because I was like, who's this infomercial, big big head, big hands guy? And I listened to the CDs back then and that helped. And then I remember when I sold my agency, I was completely depressed after. And I remember going to one of his... Um, three-day workshops where you like walk on fire. And I used to think it was fake fire until someone got burned. I was like, oh, it was real. I really did it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, him a little bit more for the mental and really how like we think and operate and that kind of stuff. But in the digital marketing space, not really. I mean, I just kind of execute. and Because I, I find if you if you really follow someone too long, you kind of start emulating them. Like a mm-hmm. long time ago, um, one of my podcasts was called the Ask Swank Show. And what do you think about Ask Gary V Show, if you remember that? So, yeah. you know, like I try not to pay attention to other people because I don't want subconsciously to copy them. Right. No, I gotcha. So have you, have you ever had a book though? The, are you a big reader or, or is there a book that's really helped you? That's like kryptonite to me, the books. Uh. <laughs> really? What about like Audible? Like listen, listening to books? Oh, I'm so I get so bored. I yeah. literally, I, it's I get, all good. You're honest about it. Yeah. All good. I've well, written more books than I've read. <laughs> got it. Got it. I love it. Well, so talk to me about now that you've seen where the digital marketing agency is is going, things like that. Like, is there a new thing that you're as excited about and you're you're really looking forward to tapping into, or you think like right now it's still digital marketing? You're just trying to figure out how to scale what you're currently doing. You know, my, my thing now is just being a, re- like, and this is my why, just being a resource I wish I had when I was running my agency. And mm-hmm. so, you know, that's why we do our podcasts and videos and all the stuff that we we do all day long. But we're also leveraging that to create other companies. And, and you know, I own another agency in Canada. You know, we're constantly looking for the right softwares to invest in that actually help agency owners and and that kind of stuff. And just really kind of building a small empire around helping agency owners. And that's, that's what I'm excited about. There's somebody out there, man, right now that is inspired. Maybe they're thinking about starting up their own agency. They say, hey, this is the best time. I do love digital marketing and I think I could be of service to someone else. But they have this little voice in their head that says maybe they're not strong enough, they're not smart enough, or they just don't have enough resources. What's the one thing that you say to that person to get them to just take action? Well, I mean... Whenever you say, I just don't have enough resources, you just haven't been resourceful enough. I mean, we've put people on the freaking moon. Mm -hmm. Like we have spaceships that go up in the air and land by themselves. Like creating an agency is not rocket science. And we always underestimate ourselves. But if you have passion for something, go try it. Like what's the worst that's going to happen? Does it work? Okay. Like that's it. Like treat it as like a game of monopoly. You're not going to win all the time, but you can restart and play again. And that's the fun of it. Now, like if, and if that doesn't excite you, if if it, if you don't treat business as a game, you probably shouldn't be running your own company because then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Like if you do it for, I want the freedom to do what I want, you you ain't gonna have that in the first couple of years. Like it takes right. many years to get to that level where you have that freedom that you think. But there's still the, the grass is 
the grass is greener on the side you water, right? Like there's still challenges we have every day and people are always like, oh, why am I doing this? And that kind of stuff. It's just, just try it out. Just go do it. And it could be the coolest thing that you ever do. Got it. Love it, man. For anybody that wants to stay connected with you, where can they find you at? Yeah, uh, just go to my website, jasonswank.com. And Swank is spelled S-W-E-N-K. So jasonswank.com. We give away 85% of our knowledge for absolutely nothing on the podcast. We have two podcasts a week, sometimes three. And we also have put out a, over 500 videos on YouTube. So go check all that stuff out and start there. <laughs> cool, my man. Well, hey, it's been a pleasure as, uh, again to have you on the show. Thanks for dropping so much knowledge and value. And I look forward to hearing the feedback. Remember Dream Nation and the dream we trust. But just as he said, we must take action even if that means that you just got to start over. Because if you don't take action, it'll only merely be a fantasy. We'll see you on the next one. That's all we got for this episode. Thank you for sticking around. That truly means a lot to me. And hopefully that means that we delivered massive value on this one. If you haven't already, the way that you could say thank you to myself and the team is just by heading over to iTunes and leaving a review and a rating. That's what iTunes loves to see. That's how we get out there even more. And I would definitely, definitely be grateful for it. I know the team would as well. Do me a favor and head on over to dreamnationpodcast.com. That's where you're going to be able to find all of the resources that we talked about in today's episode, as well as more exclusive content. And you'll also be able to sign up to our email list where we have more exclusive content. And we always love to hear the feedback from you all because you're our tribe. So remember, in the dream we trust, we'll see you on the flip side.